All right, welcome to the exciting conclusion of our study of Amos. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we just thank you for all this great conversation we've had tonight. Lord, we pray that uh, it would be edifying to us and that it would uh, help us to look for you in our lives. That It would help us kn to know what it is we're seeking in our lives, that we would be seeking you, that our souls would find rest in you, that we would be freed from the restlessness in our lives, the, uh, the longing and the desiring to be filled, and that we would just be completely filled with your spirit. We pray that our worship of you in thought, in action, and in prayer would be right because of a right heart within us, that the, um, the outward appearance of things that you don't really uh, put too much stock in wouldn't fool us into thinking we've got things right, but that we would constantly be looking at the scripture reevaluating ourselves in light of what you point out to us in scripture and really just fixing the posture of our heart in a proper way towards you so for all this we pray in jesus name amen, amen. so i'll recap the first couple of verses of chapter eight just because i really like that pun in there um and then we will finish chapter eight this is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, that's right, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings on that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. Be silent. And then the last of the five sermons in the middle section of Amos here. Um, Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale. We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and every one mourn who lives in it? And all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about, and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon, and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun, and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the beautiful young women and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who sh swear by Ashima of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. And so, um, in this last little sermon here, we see... Um, what is used for the intro of this class in the syllabus, that there is a famine coming on the land. Um, not a famine of water or of uh, food, but of hearing the word of the Lord. And so I think ultimately when people are looking back, when the priests and the scribes in um, in Judea, when, when they're finally taken into exile, remember, he's in northern Israel here, but he's from Judah, so this was probably, uh, these collections of sermons and prophecies were probably written down and stored and saved in Judea, if not contemporary with Amos, when the Assyrians invaded northern Israel, there was an exodus of northern Israelites into southern Judea, into Judea in the south. And they brought with them 
uh, scrolls and prophecies and everything else like that with them. Um, so when the Judeans got their hands on this and they read this and they saw that uh, that Amos had, had foretold of the fall of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom as well, um, and then they experienced that for themselves and they were taken into Babylon, they read this, Surely the time is coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. It'll be a famine of the word of the Lord. They really took that to heart. Um, and that's why during this time, these 70 years in exile in Babylon, we see the Old Testament canon take its final redacted form for the most part. There were still books like uh, Daniel and Esther that were being finished up. Uh, during and after that time. But the prophecies as we uh, have them now, the chronicles of First and Second Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, the Psalms, the wisdom literature, Job, even the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, um, Genesis through Deuteronomy, they all took their final redacted form during that time. Um, that's when they really took seriously the pouring over the scriptures, seeing where did we go wrong to end up here in this condition, in slavery, in a land yet again. They remembered, okay, we were slaves in Egypt. God freed us from slavery in Egypt. He gave us instructions. We're supposed to follow them or this would happen. Where did we go wrong? And so that's why you've got pouring over the scriptures at that time. You've got rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. We've got to copy the scripture. We've got to distribute it. Everybody's got to read it. This is when you get the synagogue tradition arising. Now that they don't have a temple in Jerusalem, they're meeting in synagogues, small community centers in Babylon, and they're meeting and they're studying these scrolls that have been copied and distributed now. And that's why when the Israelites emerge from exile in uh, Babylon to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and the temple there, they emerge from exile as completely monotheistic. They have, by that time, now, finally, established their identity as Israelites, altogether Israelites. They aren't divided by uh, tribes anymore, although they're still divided between the people who returned from exile and the people that were never taken into exile in the first place, that is the Samaritans. And there's a lot of tension and hatred there between those groups. But um, for the most part, they're no longer go falling into idolatry. They're not chasing after foreign gods, which is what you see happening all through this part of the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're constantly going back to other gods they're constantly being unfaithful to God's law. Now they've come out of exile because of this verse here is my suspicion. They see that. They take that to heart. They really focus on studying. They're doing what we're doing here tonight. They're studying and discussing the scriptures. They're writing it on their heart. And uh, it, it completely changed the culture of, uh, of scripture, how they look at it, how they read it, and um, basically created the situation that we have um, when Jesus is ministering a few hundred years after that. Because they kind of took what they did there in exile in Babylon and said, hmm, you know, if a little bit of this is good, let's just see how far we can push this envelope. And that's why where you get now, you've got the commentaries that surround the scriptures. So you've got all these uh, rabbis now, these scholars commentating on the scripture. You've got all these additional Sabbath laws now that are, well, there were Ten Commandments. Now there's like a million. Um, you, you've got rules about what kind of knots you can tie on the Sabbath. You can't pick this number of grains with your hand on the Sabbath. You can't go more than this many steps from your front door on the Sabbath. Um, you've got all this, you've got a hedge, you've got this fence around the law, and their thought is, well, okay, if we just 
crank up our 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 stringency with the law, we and we won't be in danger of breaking what's at the core of it. So if we can just if we can just keep ourselves following all these extra rules, then then we'll be practiced for following God's rules. But unfortunately, that goes beyond the scope of what Amos is actually pointing them to. Once again, they go out of that Goldilocks zone and they go too far in the other direction. Now, what is Amos talking about in this scripture? It's not ever the outward practice of their religion. Amos is saying, yeah, you've got full attendance on Sunday morning. Your tithes are rolling in. You've got economic prosperity. The good times are just rolling on. But you're a basket of rotten fruit that looks ripe on the outside. The posture of their heart is still not faithful towards God. And so when you've got all these extra rules around the actual law of God, it's poisoning the posture of their heart once again because now their trust is in their own rules that they've put up as a fence around God's law. They've essentially made themselves the idol now. And so what we were talking about before where your addiction is hardwired in your brain and you may just transfer from one addiction to the other might be and then then you find something that's socially acceptable or or people bury themselves. Work is probably the biggest addiction in this country. People are addicted to work, and so they never rest. And 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 that's seen as that's that's valorized in our country. Obviously, you work hard; it's going to produce great results. And so, hardworking people are valorized. And so, people that are addicted to work, they're just seen as wow. I wish I could I be hate. like that. <laughs> I wish I could be like that. I wish more people could be like that. Meanwhile, they're also being rotted from the inside out. The posture of their heart is still broken. And that's what's going on here. The Israelites are an idolatrous people by nature. They're hardwired to be idol worshippers. People, we are all idol worshippers. And so what they do in this transition from being this, this northern kingdom to going into exile to coming back they've all they've done is they've switched their addiction around they've switched their idol now their idol is themselves they say we know better than god this is how we protect god's law not realizing the whole time that god's law is there to protect them that they're to put their trust in god and that he will see them through whatever may come and that's what we're going to get through when we get to God's promises in all of this in the next chapter here, uh, we'll conclude with, with that and see why that's, that's important, that, that Amos doesn't leave them without, you know, thinking that this is all up to them. Mm -hmm. He never lets them think that this is all up to them, but that is what they take away from this, unfortunately. And that's what a lot of us can take away from Scripture, ultimately, and that's a dangerous direction to go into, thinking that, okay, now that God's given us the instruction... It's all up to us. We got to sink or swim. It's going to be on our efforts. And that's that's not, if you finish the book, that's not where Amos leaves us thinking. Uh, anyway, that's uh, that's chapter 8 for you. Any, any questions on that? I know we talked a little bit about it last week in the beginning there. Any questions about this? God is making some solemn vows here. Um, he, this is, again, he's in each of these little sermonettes here, he's swearing, uh, here by the pride of Jacob, the Lord swears by his own holiness. Uh, you know, God is making some really serious commitments here in each of these passages. Um, he isn't kidding around anymore. That, that this is kind of that strand that we follow here um, to produce the environment that you see in uh, first century Judea under Roman occupation uh, where we have reference in the gospel to the Sadducees and the Pharisees this is where it comes out of because the Pharisees were that's they're the rabbis they're the they're the tradition of the synagogue worshipers that that came out of exile 
and the Sadducees were kind of like this recreation of the priesthood that existed before the exile, because now they're back, they've got their temple there, and so the priesthood is like this aristocracy of uh, people that laid claim to being descendants of Aaron or something like that at some point in their genealogy, and so they were they were they had this hereditary position that they were entitled to serve at the temple, um, and then for everybody else that was you know the common everyday folks were probably Pharisees, and so the Pharisees, you know, it's important to understand they're not seen as evil people. They're you know the Gospels, especially Luke, is kind of critical of them. But, you know, Pharisees were well-respected members of society. It would be like, you know, your pastor or somebody. It was somebody you felt like you could talk to and learn from and have and get and discuss things without fear of judgment. And then what do we see? They're constantly judging and they're hypocrites and all this stuff. And, and the hypocrisy that Jesus addresses, the things that make Jesus angry, you'll notice... There's a couple times in the Gospels where Jesus is absolutely furious. He's never angry at sin. He'll eat dinner with sinners. He's angry at the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And so that's important. And that's what Amos is really addressing here. He's really addressing the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and the political elite of Israel. Um... He doesn't say much about the type of sin that you see detailed in Leviticus. Um, he's concerned with the treatment of the poor and ultimately this bigger concept of justice. And hypocrisy is a quick shortcut to injustice, usually. <laughs> and so that's, that's another topic we, we're going to discuss before we get out tonight, uh, the topic of justice and why it's so important to touch back on your homework assignments. So thank you for that question there, Tom. Any other questions before we move on to chapter 9? All right. Chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Strike the capitals until the thresholds shake, and shatter them on the heads of all the people, and those who are left I will kill with the sword. Not one of them shall flee away, not one of them shall escape. Though they dig into Sheol, from there they, from there shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, from there I will search out and take them. And though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the sea serpent, and it shall bite them. And though they go into the captivity in front of their enemies, there I will command the sword, and it shall kill them. And I will fix my eyes on them for harm and not for good. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who live in it mourn, and all of it rise like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt, who builds its upper chambers in the heavens and founds his bolt upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kir? The eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. So there's our first promise. First of three promises is what? I'm going to utterly destroy the house of Jacob, except that I won't utterly destroy it. <laughs> Except that I will utterly destroy it, says the Lord God. <laughs> For lo, I will command and shake the house of Israel among the nations as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say, evil shall not overtake or meet us. And here we get to the second promise. On that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, in order that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. So there's God's second promise. Now that they've been given instruction, they've been given warning, we're reminded it's not all up to the Israelites to fix things. 
their responsibility is repentance of their sin and turning to God and trusting in him. But ultimately, it says that God is going to be the one to raise up the booth of David. He's going to, after he destroys Israel, he's going to rebuild it. And then in the end of verse 12, we're reminded emphatically, says the Lord, who is the one who does this. And then the third promise, the time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps. And the treader of grapes, the one who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord, your God. And so... There's the third and final promise that God is going to restore the covenant community, that God is going to give them abundance once more. Right now, they have all these things that God is talking about promising to deliver to them. They've got incredible wealth. They've got beautiful summer and winter homes. They've got tons of wine. They're binge drinking out of bowls after all. And so God's saying, hey, I'm going to give you all these things. <laughs> right now, the people in Israel are attributing this to Jeroboam the second, of course. Jeroboam is one of the most loved and popular kings of northern Israel's history. But most of the prophets, actually all the prophets that talk about him, remember him as one of the worst. <laughs> And so these people are like, wow, you know, it's kind of like us when we've got a president and, oh, my stocks are doing great. Thank you, Obama. Thank you, Trump. Whoever it is that's in charge when those things go up, (coughs) we attribute it to whoever's in charge. But God's saying, I'm going to be the one to deliver peace and plenty upon you. And then I just think this is one of the most beautiful ways for Amos and, and God, really, to end this prophecy. The last words, says the Lord your God. We're reminded there at the very end that this God is our God. He's for us. He's for us. He isn't eternally he's not eternally against us. He is against the things we're doing. He hates the sin. He hates the sin, but he loves us. And so we've got this tension here that's illustrated throughout the book of Amos. Um, uh oh, let's see here. Somebody borrowed my dry erase markers and I have lost them. I'll go get you one. Do you have some? Oh, that'd be great. So. So what would you say are the common themes that run throughout Amos? Or what, what's the biggest theme we see running throughout Amos here in these nine chapters? I'll give you a hint. It starts with J and it's not Jesus. <laughs> justice. 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 Think like justice. Batman. Justice. 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 Yeah, justice. What's the what's the theme that Amos ends on? It's an attribute of God. Love. And so these are the two attributes of God that run throughout the prophecy, Amos. We've got the Lion of Judah roaring, and we've got the Lord, your God, who's going to restore Israel. Um, These things kind of go back and forth and dance with each other. Um, If we were to say that God is just 
completely just no love we'd have we'd have tyranny not sure that's how you spell it but two wins thanks tyranny <laughs> if we had just love and no justice we'd have impotence we'd have an ineffective king we wouldn't have a god who's a king we'd have some snivelly whiny nobody that's not going to do any good for us whatsoever but god is completely just and he's completely loving so how do we reconcile these two attributes of god I think the reason why I asked you to write on justice for the last homework assignment was to really work out what what justice is. And I think from the, our last lecture, uh, we should have the feeling, the inclination, that justice is an action, that love is an action, should be evident from most of my preaching. Um, so these two actions, they're not opposed to one another. Um, Loving your neighbor means doing justice to your neighbor. Doing justice to your neighbor means loving your neighbor. And so when God is acting justly towards us, when he's acting lovingly towards us, what we see worked out of that dance there are these two things that are quite amazing. They are grace and mercy. And these are really important to understand. See, if you've got justice, um, what ultimately... I, I think, all right, so here's, here's what I wrote for, for justice. Um, justice is, is action that makes a wrong situation right. It makes, it's an action. So, so this is how we can live in the tension that God is promising us deliverance and all this stuff here. But right now, things are not right. We are restless. Our souls are not content completely to rest in God. There's so much more that yet needs to be done. There's disease. My throat's sore. There's, you know, there's all kinds of things going on that are wrong in the world. Justice is the, when, when God is, saying I'm going to do justice he's saying that someday I am going to do something that will make your past wrong situations right I'm going to change your heart where it's I'm going to do open heart surgery on you Tom and I'm going to make you so that you're a good human being through and through and so this is the attempt of our justice system we call it a justice system in our country. It's a secular justice system. Um, but we can't make perfect justice. No. Because, well, sometimes we condemn innocent people, but even when we get the right person and the right crime, we still can't make a wrong situation right. No. It doesn't matter how many times you retributively deliver murder you will not make the first murder right ever <clears throat> so that's that's one of the shortcomings of our justice system is it's an in a bit we can't make justice we can't make justice with ourselves and amongst ourselves so we're trying to make justice and it works out great when we know we can't make justice because it keeps us humble. It's really dangerous when we think that what we are doing is justice. <laughs> that's when it that's when it tends to kind of lean towards a bad end. Um, but what happens when um, when we all right? So we recognize that if we kill somebody, we can't make justice out of that situation because we can't ever restore the life that's been taken. So we say, close enough, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life. You killed somebody, you lose your life. 
That's as close as we get to justice. Um, but what happens when we hear about God's justice and we hear that, you name it, any one of those sins, any one of the laws of God are mentioned, what is the most common punishment for lawlessness with God? Death. Mm-hmm. Death by stoning. Oh, yeah. You 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 sleep with the wrong person. You steal from from anybody. You you disobey your parents. Death. Paul makes it clear that the you break one law, you break all the law. Why is that? And why is it that death, not just death here and now, but eternal wrath of God in hell, is a fitting punishment? for that why is an eternal punishment necessary for justice to be done what do you do when there's somebody that that uh, <clears throat> tries to influence you and in making a decision that's not just what do you do about that what do you do about that ignore them well, I know that's what I did, but, that's, okay. but you're told because of a of a uh, <clears throat> you're working in a particular business, okay, and the guy that comes up to you, he's the head of the union that you belong to, that you have to follow the rules for, mm-hmm. and he says to you, you know, you're going to be called in for this hearing this afternoon, and what you say could cause him to lose his job and his family wouldn't have a support. So I said, well, I'll tell you what. If they ask the right questions, I will give them the correct answer, honest answer. I said, I'm not lying for you or anybody else. Hmm. So that's the way I left it. And hmm. he lost his job. Hmm. So in that situation, that I was put into a spot where... You can't win. That's right. You can't win. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah, well, that that is that should show you the the inherent injustice in the system of which you were a part of. Yeah, you were you were a member in a in a system that wasn't concerned with actual justice. No, they that's weren't right. actually concerned with justice. No, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, is what it sounds like to me. Yeah. So, the thing with God's law is we are a part of that system that God has made. Whether we want it, whether we like it or not, we're a part of that system. We are accountable to God's demand for justice, whether we like it or not. We can't exit it. This this last part of um, chapter nine, where it's saying, you know, people can go to the end of the seas. I'm going to scoop them out. You can go up to the stars. I'm going to swat you down. We can't we can't get out of God's system of judgment. We can't get out of His system of justice, and so. Ultimately, the fact that God tells us his law in the first place, the fact that God reveals to us that there is a standard, is a huge gesture of grace. Because, well, let me just define these two terms first before we get into them a little bit more. Grace is... Let's see here. Grace is the good stuff that we didn't earn. There's no reason why God ever had to share with us that there is a standard that he's going to judge us to. No reason that he ever needed to tell us that. He was doing us a favor by telling us that. He was doing us a favor because following God's laws actually leads to flourishing of society and our betterment, really. Uh, it's good for us. It's good for everybody. Um, there was a friend of mine down in Kerhonksen who was um, eight years old when he went to a German concentration camp, and when the Russians liberated him, he was sent to a Siberian gulag. For He was there in one prison or another until he was 54. 
he got out, he went to Kazakhstan, built a creamery with the money, he jumped out and came to New York City, and he's lived in Kurhangsan, it's been the longest he's ever lived in one place since 1987. He tells me when he was in the Gulag, they made fun of him for being a Christian, because all the communists were atheists, of course, and atheists attacked their own kind even, I mean, the communists attacked their own kind even, had them in there. Uh, why do you follow those commandments? Those are for old ladies. And he said, old ladies? You mean to tell me don't steal is only good for old ladies? No, that's good for you, that's good for me. The government is stealing from all of us. It's stolen our liberty by putting us here. It's stolen our labor by forcing us to work for nothing. It's stolen our money. You know, we're worse off than we were before. When I was, he said he was worse off there in communist Siberia in a gulag than he was in a German concentration camp. He said there they taught him a trade, they educated him, they made him, they, they had him, they had him labor, of course, but they, they education was available to him. Uh, there was a, a Bible was allowed to him in there. Um, yeah, that's something I never would have thought happened. So, so he's, in, he's in Siberia now, and, and people are telling him that God's laws are just for old ladies. Mm. There's something that's, that's a sentimental thought, but it's not really practical in our world today. And, uh, and really, God's law is actually not just good for little old ladies. It's good for everybody. Don't murder. That's a rule for everybody. Yeah. Don't steal. That's for everybody. All of those laws, all of them, are for everybody. And so ultimately, breaking one of them is, um, is, is, is rejecting God's grace, really. God's given us these laws out of nothing but sheer grace and when we break them uh, it means ultimately what David confesses when he um, when he sleeps with Bathsheba and he murders Uriah his wife his husband her husband uh, oh, complicated affair there uh, he says he confesses to God against you alone have I sinned ultimately breaking of every law is an offense against the law giver, the authority behind it. And so, um, you break any law, you break any of these connections here, you're breaking God. You're breaking God. Yeah, you're 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 a, you're assaulting God basically. And so, we realize, you know, if if you kill an ant, there should be a lesser punishment than if you kill a dog. There should be a greater punishment if you kill a person. God is of infinite value. There is none of this would exist if it weren't for God. Our existence, our world, our universe, all owes its existence to God. And so sin against God and his infinite value is how we arrive at the conclusion that a finite being us little ants down here this is how we warrant an infinite punishment for sinning against an infinitely valuable God and so that's why God's law and, it's, and our breaking of it is taken so severely and so seriously if you're ever wondering wow that seems a little harsh we got to remember we're not committing sins against each other that can be dealt with pretty closely according to our system of justice in the world eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth but we're not actually just dealing with that in every sin we're actually assaulting God's infinite sovereign majesty and so an affront against God is necessarily dealt, has to be dealt with very harshly if God is a good God he's going to confront the evil in the world. He's got to confront the evil with justice. If he loves himself, if he loves the victims, he has to confront evil with his justice. So that's why these two are so inseparable. Now, that's grace. Grace is God giving us his law, first of all. Mercy is the fact that even though we've broken it, he hasn't killed us yet. <laughs> Mercy is um, not getting the evil or the punishment 
that we do deserve. So, when you look at it here, we've done nothing to earn anything good from God, but he gives it to us anyway. That's called grace. We've done everything to deserve God's wrath, but we're alive and well, talking with each other here today. And so, we've got God's mercy. Yeah, if, if we were all of us to experience God's justice right now, then nobody could stand. Um, this Sunday, I, I used the analogy that um, from Isaiah chapter 6 that standing in the presence of God's holiness and justice is kind of like um, uh, standing underneath a Saturn V rocket right before it's about to take off. You know, down in Cape Canaveral, you got all those little geckos and everything like that. And so if you know, you know what happens to those little geckos when, when those rockets take off? Incinerate something. The same thing that happens to everything else. It's gone. It's just vaporized. Yep. It is no more. Uh, that's what we are like standing before God. That's why when Isaiah sees God seated on the throne in his holiness there in chapter 6, he says, uh-oh, I don't belong here. I'm in the wrong place. I'm underneath a Saturn V rocket right before it's about to take off and convert 20 tons of fuel per second into 100,000, 100 million pounds of thrust. thrust. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what would happen to us if we were to experience God's justice right now. We'd be, we couldn't stand. We, and, that's why, and that's what we see here in, in um, Amos when he says, Oh, there, I saw this consuming fire. I saw a plague of locusts. And I said to the Lord, Oh God, have mercy on Jacob. He's so little he can't stand. Nobody can stand against the execution of God's judgment. And so the fact that we're here should tell us we are experiencing God's mercy right now. When Paul says we are waiting for Jesus to come, we're patiently waiting for God to bring his kingdom here, we shouldn't see it as though he's delaying, as though he forgot about us. It's been 2,000 years since Christ ascended into heaven and said he'd come again. 2,000 years. Should we take that as maybe God forgot about us maybe God's asleep no Paul says take this as an extended period of grace and mercy because God's waiting for more people to repent because when Christ returns his justice and judgment is going to be enacted and anybody who's not on the side of Christ is going to end up like a gecko underneath a rocket so our waiting right now this interlude in history that we're experiencing right now is God's grace and mercy being enacted on us. And we have grace and mercy because of the dancing around and the mixing and the combination of God's justice and his love. Any questions? Well, thank you for joining us for the conclusion of Amos. May God bless you. May God look favorably upon you. And may he set upon you his everlasting peace through his grace and mercy in Christ. Amen.